Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our panel here on urban transportation. I'm Shannon Osaka. I'm a climate reporter for The Washington Post. And I'm joined here by the lovely Mayor Daniela Levine Cava <laughs> of Miami-Dade, <laughs> Mayor Justin Bibb of Cleveland, Yay. and the chair of the Climate Mayors, and US Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Polly Trottenberg. Yay. So I'd love to turn to Mayor Bibb first. You are the new chair of Climate Mayors, which is a network of over 300 mayors who are working for climate action. What are the key levers of change that you see mayors being able to pull, and how are you looking to activate those levers in 2024? I often say that America's mayors are at the front lines of the many issues we're facing across our country, but we are also at the front lines of the solutions yes. to these issues. <laughs> and so uh, this is the year of action for climate mayors, leveraging all the amazing federal investment that this president has given us to address climate change across the country. So we're engaging the private sector to leverage that investment. We want to make sure we're bringing our residents along as well, too, because most folks in Cleveland have no idea what the Inflation Reduction Act is or what the bipartisan infrastructure bill is. But here's what they do know. They want clean water fresh air and safe streets. And that has to be how we, talk, how we talk about these critical core policy issues every single day. And Mayor Levine Cava, Florida has the second highest number of EV registrations in the country, but it still takes a lot to move a very urbanized environment with multifamily housing to electric vehicles. How is Miami-Dade working on this and trying to boost EV adoption in the city? We are EV friendly, we are EV ready. We've built in EV charging uh, facilities to a lot of our county buildings and um, parking areas. And I also got legislation passed to require new multi uh, dwellings to have the capacity for EV infrastructure. And we've electrified our fleet. Just yesterday, uh, Administrator Regan from the EPA was down to celebrate 50 new electric school buses on top of the 50 that they already, yeah, that they had already committed. So 100 bus fleet, and we already are matching that. We have 70 in service, and it'll be 100 uh, very shortly, and we're going up to 170. So we expect to be the largest electrified fleet, including on our South Dade corridor, where it will all be bus rapid transit, electric buses, the first in the nation. Yes. I want to turn to the Deputy Secretary. This is a very busy time for DOT. You have the bipartisan infrastructure law. You have the IRA funds. What are you seeing as the challenges in the rollout of those funds? And I understand that you also may have an announcement that you want to make. I do have an announcement. Thank you so much, <laughs> Shannon. Great to be here with two, I have to say, of our country's most amazing mayors. Um, <laughs> let me talk about the announcement and then get to your question. So you are right. Between the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, DOT is having the opportunity to roll out an unprecedented set of programs and projects to address climate change. It is truly, as you say, one of the most exciting and busy times to be in transportation. Today we will be rolling out, we'll see if we can get the, the information up on screen. If not, you can go online. Our Low Carbon Transportation Materials Program, $2 billion that will be apportioned to states and there'll be a competitive program for, for cities and counties to look at innovative ways to decarbonize the transportation construction and manufacturing process. And I know looking at this crowd, I'm sure we have some private sector innovators in the audience. This is a program we hope will really bring innovation, public-private partnerships, looking at new ways we can manufacture materials, reduce carbon usage throughout the whole transportation process, and train the workforce, too, to be a part of what we hope will be an amazing decarbonization of how we build and operate our transportation projects. It builds upon just to sort of ask for the challenge. We're running a low carbon program, a protect program for climate resiliency, roadway safety, things that I know these mayors and others around the country have been great partners in. So we're busy, um, but it's a good kind of busy. And we're grateful for the opportunity and the resources that have come through our, our president's legislation to tackle climate. As you say, cities are on the front lines. Transportation is too. Transportation is the biggest part of the carbon emissions in our country, but we will be a biggest part of the solution as well. Thank you. 
We've talked a little bit about electric mobility, EVs, things like that, but as climate folks here, I think we all know that we also need to move away from a very car-centric mm -hmm. culture. And I'm curious, I wanna to turn to the mayors first on this, but we've heard this concept of the 15-minute city, and it's gotten some interesting attention as well from some parts of media. But can you talk about sort of what this concept is and how mayors can help to move towards that more walkable, more pedestrianized version of the city? Maybe, yeah, Mayor Bibb, let's go well, first. Well, I saw this firsthand uh, during the pandemic when, you know, in many parts of our city, our residents didn't have a grocery store they could go to within 15 minutes that sold fresh fruits and vegetables. Many folks didn't have access to good quality transit within 15 minutes. So this is really about, in my opinion, ensuring we have high quality amenities in every part of our city. That's why uh, we want to become in Cleveland one of the first 15 minute cities in North America because we truly have to prioritize people over cars. Uh, too many of our residents are dying on our streets and so we are working aggressively to have more protected bike lanes. We also need to make sure that as we think about safety, um, speed tables, those things go a long way to give our residents confidence that our streets are safe for families and children. And by doing this, this shows us that we're focused on equity and also focused on justice as well too, but it also helps us to be more economically competitive long term as a city as well. Have you had any backlash against this idea of the 15-minute city? Because I know that that has yeah. happened in some places. A lot of backlash <laughs> um, from a, a lot of misinformation uh, in our media. Uh, I'll give you one example. One of our leads in our city planning department uh, became the ire of the extreme right because we were introducing legislation to eliminate parking minimums in our streets. Mm. Uh, and it's a shame that we have this toxic media environment that doesn't allow us to have basic, common sense, pragmatic conversations about what makes our cities great. And so we as mayors have to do a better job of combating this misinformation in our media and really tell our residents exactly what these plans and policies are all about. Mayor Daniela, how do you think about this? How do you think about sort of reorienting streets away from cars, more towards smart transit? We're very land constrained. We have the ocean, we have the Everglades, and a kind of a narrow strip. I heard it uh, described recently as between the sharks and the alligators. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that we cannot just continue to build in the old suburban patterns, and we don't have infrastructure more traffic as a result, et cetera. So we have intensely densified our transportation corridors and also created other incentives for more densely building. So we created something called the Rapid tra uh, Transit Zone along our, um, our corridors, which we identified aggressively to build out our public transit. The only solution for traffic, we do have it, ladies and gentlemen, here, uh, is transit. We cannot build roads to solve that problem. So it's a, uh, yep, that was an applause line I heard. Uh, <laughs> uh, it works together. We have to uh, build taller instead of out into our farm and uh, endangered lands and protecting our water supply, our Everglades, uh, and so on. And uh, we've done it through this, this zone that allows for greater densification, fewer parking requirements. Uh, and uh, a good bit of subsidy as well, and requirements for mixed income, mm. so that we do have a range of income mixes in these transit corridors, very popular. We're even hoping for a major federal grant for our north <laughs> corridor, uh, which isn't yet developed along that corridor, but we've shown that once we make the, the plans, that the people and the development will come on our south corridor. So this is a little out of the the past pattern of kind of get in line for your major transit projects and you have to prove density. Well, we know that density is coming and we've proven it and so we're so grateful that this administration has found other ways of prioritizing some of these projects. And uh, <laughs> she already knows. <laughs> but uh, truthfully, as far as pushback, um, 
Really not so much, especially with the fact that we have so many newcomers. We have people coming from urban areas where they're used to world-class transit or uh, young people who prefer not to have cars, and even some of us older folks that are ready to give up our, our yards and move into uh, you know that 15-minute uh, focal area. I'm not quite there yet, but I'll get there. Uh, so I think we have really all the right ingredients to uh, incentivize and motivate to build differently. But it, there are some headwinds because uh, there is a demand. There's a huge demand for housing and the costs are very high. And uh, so it's sometimes cheaper to build on that open land. And so we have to educate people about the cost of that. Absolutely. And Deputy Secretary, how is the Department of Transportation working, as Mayor Daniela mentioned, to try to help incentivize that moving forward? Right, I mean, we are very focused, again, in addition to all the programs to decarbonize the transportation sector, to look at ways, obviously, that we can help with mode shifting, get more people out of cars, onto mass transit. We are making record-breaking investments in transit, in passenger rail, and in projects that prioritize roadway safety, active transportation. So part of how we're doing that is really tapping into the creativity and the local voices. Um, we have extraordinary grant dollars at our fingertips, and the best ideas are coming from all over the country, from cities large and small, from tribal areas, and part of what we're doing is helping to partner with those communities to get some of those ideas on the ground. Um, something I had a lot of experience with in New York, um, particularly, particularly with our Safe Streets and Roads for All, doing quick pilot projects, tactical urbanism, getting some of the, that paint on the ground so that your citizens can start to see the possibilities of these projects, of a new bus lane, of a new bike lane. And that helps build the support that sometimes I think we've all had in our opportunities in, in urban government. You need to show people, sometimes you need to show people and seeing is believing and we're getting to be a real partner in that. We're also with our sister agencies, with HUD and Department of Energy and EPA, trying to think together holistically about the land use issues, transportation efficiency, those bigger picture issues which are multidisciplinary, but which are really the ways we're gonna help transform cities and make them, in some cases, more of that 15-minute city. Absolutely. So we have all of this new funding that's flowing all throughout the country trying to remake our transportation system. I mean, what do mayors need from the Biden administration and vice versa in order to really make these collaborations work? Mayor Bibb. Well, I, I have to say, I've only been mayor for uh, over two years now, but in my lifetime, I've never seen an administration who cares about cities like this administration does. And as, as the president said in his State of the Union address, you know, America's comeback is gonna be fueled by America's cities and towns. And as I look at Cleveland's future, making sure we continue to leverage these federal investments in a very equitable way is a key part of my vision and focus as mayor. I'll give you an example. You know, as we're thinking about the new EV boom uh, in our country and how that federal investment is gonna change the ecosystem of electric vehicles across the country, it's so important that particularly in majority black cities like Cleveland, that those residents feel like they can be a part of that movement. And so we prioritize, as we are launching new EV stations across our city, we're prioritizing building them in black and brown neighborhoods to help connect the dots. And so as we launch these new EV charging stations and go door to door to talk about the EV tax credits, it gives them confidence that they are a part of this movement and we couldn't have got it done without this administration working with America's mayors. Well, it's been great. Okay, we are ready to receive all of those investments and we're very grateful for, for what we have received. In fact, we do a quarterly report and we're up to almost 1.4 billion in discretionary federal grants through these programs uh, across the board and many of them focused on transportation, um, including at the airport and the seaport. So uh, we, we have, um, for example, gotten funds for uh, uh, Vision Zero mm -hmm. to reduce pedestrian and bicycle injuries. Unfortunately, that is a, a big challenge, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that, because if we want people to be in 15-minute cities, we have to keep them safe. Uh, we also 
have been hugely supported for our solar projects, uh, the EV that we've mentioned, and we're looking also at the elective pay option, which is really a, a rebate. Uh, it's like a tax rebate for those that don't pay taxes, if you get it. Uh, but it's really going to be huge for us in helping us to expand our solar uh, and, and other uh, energy reduction. We also have the Priority Climate Action Plan that we've developed thanks to the EPA Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. We got a planning grant and now we're going for the big dollars. Uh, and we're also designated as a climate tech hub by U.S. Uh, Commerce and put in the full proposal to draw down multi-millions to help us to develop the industry around climate. Advances. So it's it's been a beautiful partnership, a beautiful relationship. Uh, we're we're like I say, I'm like like this, ready at the shoot. <laughs> Hands out. <laughs> Debbie, All right. Secretary. Well, I I thank you, mayors, and and I will say I am really proud to be part of the Biden Harris administration, which you are right, really cares about cities and sees them on the front line of delivering our agenda of infrastructure investment, of job creation, of equity, of addressing climate change. And look, at DOT, we like to brag. I was transportation commissioner in the biggest city in the country for seven years and on the front lines for a lot of the types of things you're trying to do. And obviously, our secretary, former mayor himself, uh, I would say of a small city, he would say of a mid-sized city um, <laughs> uh, in Indiana. But I think both of us bring our experiences actually of being in small and large cities and how you do navigate working with the federal government. And you know, small communities feel like it's challenging. It's challenging for big cities too. But that focus has gone into particularly, traditionally transportation funds tend to go to states. But we now have a number of programs and, and these two cities and so many others around the country have been successful in competing for those dollars, again, for roadway safety, for climate projects, for EV charging. And you are absolutely right, Mayor Bibb, for the EV charging dollars that we have given out to local communities. We've put an enormous focus on equity communities, and 70% of those dollars have gone to disadvantaged communities. So, you know, we have programs specifically targeted to cities, and, you know, what, what, what would we like from cities? We have declared year four of the Biden Harris administration to be the year of project delivery. So obviously, we want to see amazing work on the ground in cities all over the country, and we stand ready to be partners, of course, to help make it happen. Wonderful. Well, I promised folks backstage that I would absolutely keep this to 20 minutes, so let's have a round of applause for our panelists.